Hey, this is Winter with the Shift Spotlight, and today we are here with Jim Manning, and he can be found at jimmanning.com. Welcome to the show, Jim. Thanks for having me, Winter. I really appreciate it. And um, uh, what a neat concept you guys and your group have going with the the shift spotlight and and shifts do happen sometimes, right? Yeah, shifts do happen. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for yeah. thanks for pulling that in and saying that. I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, all right, you seem fun. Let's talk about some fun. Give us a fun fact about you that people may not know. Oh boy. Okay. So I have four small kids and for nine years now, I have been in the diaper phase of my life and it's been <laughs> continuous. It has not ended. And my youngest is three years old. He understands what going on the potty is and yet he refuses to go on the potty number two. So, uh, and when I ask him, I say, Hey, Drew, uh, uh, daddy's been doing this for nine years. I'm ready. Uh, can you, can you go pot? Can you go poop on the potty? He says, well, dad, uh, you know what? I'm going to wait till I'm six. And I say, okay, I need it now. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to be six. the diaper phase for, uh, with a six year old. <laughs> <laughs> are we good? Are we going to have any more kids? Or you think you're like phasing uh, out? Of the type of phase? uh, yeah, it's looking like that, that, that ship has sailed that we're, we're, we're done with that with the four. And you're making a shift there too. That's right. Yeah. We have our, our hands full, so to speak. You're, you're, you're done cleaning <laughs> yeah. up shift. So, yes, uh, right. oh man, this is so awesome. I'm going to have fun with this one today. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Okay. So why don't you tell us at a high level, what it is, what, like, tell us what you do. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm a real estate entrepreneur. Uh, I've founded five companies, four run without me now. And um, uh, we've done over 3,500 deals in the single family space and and have really scaled it up. I, I, we started doing a, a lot of deals about 10 years ago. And um, at one point we had uh, 120 houses that we were flipping. And to put that in the context, the largest brokerage in St. Louis only had 105 listings at the same time of of clients that they were looking to sell. So uh, we've done a tremendous amount of deals. And oh my goodness, there's uh, been an entrepreneur since 2006. Uh, there's been a lot of ups and downs. It has been a ride. What can I yeah, say? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so, I mean... You're talking my language. That's that's a world I know really well. The three doors represent three different aspects of real estate. So let me just clarify. You're not a real tour. You know, you're not doing like one off one home sales. So let's talk about these three different doors. Yeah. So that's the original company we founded and we call it three doors because uh, we believe in being an advisor for our homeowners and and uh, a realtor might say, hey, list the property for $300,000 and you can make, you know, you can make 280 after commissions and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and the reality is, is that there's uh, an as is cash sale that you can sell your property for. And also there's creative financing. We've helped people structure deals after they sell their house and make over $40,000 in passive income. So mm -hmm. Uh, and a lot of people don't realize that you can do that. Uh, back in the 1970s, 1980s, um, owner finance structures were, were uh, the main way people sold their properties because interest rates raised um, uh, up up uh, a crazy amount. So yeah, like my, um, my stepdad. My stepdad is uh, 65, and I I literally don't think because he comes from that time, and I literally don't think that a deal that has ever been done, either me as his agent or him buying something or selling something, doesn't have a level of owner financing or the word owner financing gets dropped. Like it's just in his DNA. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, there's ways to be creative and, and, and make a risk adjusted returns. Right. And, and if you've already lived in a property, you already know exactly what it is and how it's going to be good. Like what a great way uh, to turn your equity and and to leverage a lower interest rate, what a great opportunity uh, to offer a buyer and say, no, hey, you don't need a bank. Let me be your bank, and I'd yeah. like to make some. I'd like to make some income for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I I love owner financing. Like it's, I think people, I think people, you know, don't don't consider it enough as as an investment vehicle, which. We'll talk about, you know, your your passive wealth income or podcast that you have going on yeah. as well, too. But, um, you know, what tell us about your journey um, in becoming a CEO and a business leader and and how you got there, how you built. And you, I said now four 
are all running on their own. So let's talk about that a little bit. How did it all come about? Okay. Well, I'll be just right to the point. I know winter, I know you like to get to it. (laughs) (laughs) So um, uh, my first job out of college was working for a self-made billionaire. Mm. And uh, it was an amazing experience because on one hand, I saw what entrepreneurship can do because he was self-made. He started and founded a company that turned into the the biggest of its kind on a nationwide uh, level, right? right? I got to fly on private jets. I got to a, a drink Krug champagne, thousand dollar bottles of champagne. Um, and this was just after college when I had no appreciation. I was still in chugging mode. And um, <laughs> if, I, if I had to give myself some advice, it would be, hey, Jim, uh, slow down a little bit and enjoy this expensive champagne. But um, uh, so I, 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 and I started idolizing this guy, right? And then, um, uh, and then as the second week wore on and, and I was working and doing my freelance job for him, I started to find out that he was miserable. His family hated him. Um, and he, you know, he just, just wasn't able to enjoy it. So he had the ultimate success and it, and it was at the ultimate cost. Mm. So as a 22 year old, right out of college, I, I can't think of a better experience to, uh, to see that. And so then after I got done with my freelance job, I got into corporate America. I knew within a, a couple hours that that wasn't going to be for me, uh, pushing paperwork and not doing something that had a tangible value for the community. Uh, and then I fell in love with real estate. I said, I thought, love the idea of, of fixing property and literally making a home for a family. Uh, mm-hmm. So improving a little piece of the world. And then also uh, the financial upside. So you could call myself like a, a pragmatic altruist where I, I like to make money and generate a lot of funds. And I like to help people at the same time and and do both. So uh, then we got into real estate and uh, founded the company in my parents' unfinished basement. I, I was uh, living with a friend, moved back home. Uh, you know, decided, you know, I, I couldn't handle that after a few months. And then I moved into a one bedroom shotgun style apartment on in, in the hill of St. Louis. It's a little Italian community and um, worked out of my family room for uh, the next three, four years or uh, I can hard to remember now. I, I just turned 40 and my memory's getting a little bit phasey. Oh, right yeah. Now. Um, but wait till you uh, hit 45 and the eyesight starts to, you know, you start oh, to really? like, oh, yeah, and, and, and you say, no, it's not going to happen to me. <laughs> That's what I did. And then all of a sudden you're doing the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and then we, you know, so then we, uh, you know, we were doing just a tra- traditional investment company. Uh, we made a couple investment mistakes and, um, uh, we were sitting on three properties, uh, on the market that weren't selling, and all of our cash was invested into these properties. And I mean, remember being very stressed out about it and um, had a little bit of a health scare. I, I hit my head, uh, had a deep concussion, but um, because, but when I hit my head and had the concussion, I shaked a little bit. So they weren't sure if I had a seizure or, or what was going on. And, and um, I remember, you know, that was my rock bottom moment. I was sitting in the hospital um uh, for a couple of days till all the tests got done, not knowing if I was dying or if I was going to be okay. And, um, uh, ended up the test ended up coming back. Okay. And I had a, uh, I had a new why though, not my now wife, uh, my uh, girlfriend at the time was with me the whole time. I remember looking at her while she's sleeping in an, a crazy, uncomfortable chair and, um, being like, man, she's just with me. And I've only been dating her a couple of months. I want to spend the rest of my life with this woman. And what it was a glorious feeling. Cause like having that clarity, like, okay, she is my person. And then at the same time, uh, I looked at it and I said, all of my money's tied into these real estate deals that are sitting on the market. Like, like I'm, I'm living on credit card debt right now. I can't afford to like even get her a ring. Uh, so, um, so that was also, a, a, a you know, that was a bit of a gut wrenching moment, um, yeah. having that, having, having that joy and then having the, the crushing reality of, of, um, uh, not being able to do it right away. And I I think that's such a common thing that people can relate to when you are driven and especially in the man role, I would say is like, I've got to be right here before I can be right here, you know? And I think sometimes us, us women, we don't always understand that that side of it. Right. But keep going. I love your authenticity. Yeah, that's right. And then, um, so then I, you know, I'm, I'm facing this and because I hit my head 
uh, they weren't sure if I had a seizure or not. Turns out I didn't. I know that now. Um, but at the time when you have a seizure, you're not allowed to drive for six months. So mm. I'm staring at living on credit card debt, all literally my entire life savings in these three properties and now not being able to drive for six months. And, uh, the fortunate thing was that I, I had gotten my real estate license just to run comparables, uh, mm -hmm. for my investment deals. And I, I assessed the situation with my business partner and, um, uh, we said, Hey, we have a real estate license. Let's just be realtors for a little bit. And short sales were the type of deals that was uh, really where the market of the moment was at the time. And we just did a bunch of short sale listings, got through the, the bad deals that we did. And, um, what came of that is, is, is two really important lessons. Uh, the first lesson is, um, uh, my why got so crystal clear when I started playing a bigger game and the game was, I want to marry this woman. Nice. Uh, it didn't matter that I couldn't drive for six months. It didn't matter that I was living on credit card debt. Um, I was going to find a way to marry her. Mm -hmm. And everything, every other obstacle I met, yeah, I mean, it took about 18 months and it was really painful. It was really tough, uh, but we kept going and we mm -hmm. were able to make it, um, we were able to make it through it. Then the other lesson I learned was that when you're scaling a business, there's hidden obstacles uh, that if you're so busy doing deals that you... Um, that, that you can miss that, that can create bottlenecks within your organization. So yeah. the first main one that we hit that was restricting our growth, uh, was our capital our financing structure. So what we were doing was we were taking a hundred percent of, of private individuals money for the purchase price. And then we were self, <clears throat> we were self-funding out of pocket, all the repairs that went into the properties. Mm. So, so that model worked for us. We were making money, but then we were rolling all of our profits into the next deal and into the next right. deal. And no, oh, now we have enough money to, to, to put into three deals. Fantastic. Right. Uh, well, it was fantastic while everything was going right. And then the second, uh, one little hiccup yeah. happened and the, then the whole thing had, the whole thing shifted <laughs> you know, we had to yeah, shift our business shifted. model a little bit there. Right. Uh, she, by the way, she's paid me to say that. No, <laughs> but, 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 but anyway, so so then then we got to thinking about it. We're like, well, we're restricted to the amount of money we have is, is the, how many deals that we can do. And we can only afford right now as 25 year olds, we can only afford so much. And then we thought, well, what if we go to our investors and just say, hey, give us 100 percent of everything, the, the, the fix up, uh, the fix up money and the re and the purchase price. And I wonder if they would do that. So we, you know, and at that time we had already been, uh, paying our private lenders a hundred percent of the time for four years. And, and, you know, we made every payment and everything like that. Uh, and so we asked them and they said, yeah, oh yeah, we don't care. We trust you guys. I'm like, whoa, well, that's amazing. And now all of a sudden we just removed that barrier to growth. Yeah. And now instead of being able to do three deals at a time and then putting our whole company in jeopardy of falling apart, if we make a mistake, we can do a 100% of the deals financed and the amount of deals we do is only limited to the amount of money that we can raise. Mm. And so now it just became a game of, okay, well, how many deals can we find and how much money can we raise? And then that's where we started to take, that's when we took the next step up. We started scaling and then we got up to the 120 deal flips at the same time. So, so you've um, got to have like, a, not... a, you've got to have like a, a, a big team to run deals of that size. So how many, how many full-time employees do you have working for you? Yeah. So this is how long I've been doing it for. So we have shifted again since the high flip model. So this was, <laughs> so this was back in 2016, maybe eight years ago at our, or maybe 2017, my goodness. Um, and we got up to, we got up to where we bought over 300 deals in the same year. And our sweet spot had been like a hundred, 150 deals purchased. Right. And, uh, when we bought the 300 deals, our ops team hated us. We hated us. Um, uh, or we had three, your partners experience. hated you. Everybody hated you. <laughs> managers. Um, uh, we did all, we had, oh my gosh, it's hard to even remember now, but, uh, Yeah, you're coming back. in and out a little bit. Oh, uh, shoot. Sorry. It's yeah, okay. The internet's normally really good here. Sorry about that. I, I it's okay. Uh, but, so you asked me how many uh, deals that we had. 
um, how many employees how, how, how many employees yeah. that we had so i i think so i want to say our team was about uh 50 people like like in it like when it was at its biggest when we were doing all of those volumes mm -hmm. uh now that doesn't include all the general contractors and all the subs that we uh, that we had on 1099. Uh, we had three full-time construction managers that were managing general contractors because uh, even though those three full-time employees, they didn't have enough time uh, to GC our own projects because there was that many of them, right? And um, the problem with the jump we scaled too quickly was uh, was we did not have the ops team and the infrastructure to handle doing double the deals. Yeah. And so then we looked at our bank account at the end of the year and we were still profitable, but we made less money than the year we had done half the deals. So then we were like, oh, okay, well, um, uh, that was the, that was the year that our quest for more deals got replaced with our quest to run the most profitable organization we can. That's <laughs> and right. Not care That's about right. The amount of deals that That's always, that, that is a huge CEO, like common thing that CEOs experience through a failure and we call it failing fast over here. Um, that was probably for you failing hard, but you know, there's, there's always that, well, sometimes you think you want bigger, better, more. And then, and then sometimes you want, uh, you realize, no, I, I need a mini business that covers my bills and then some, or I need a business that allows me to travel. Like the, the, what of the business gets adjusted along the way. That's right. That's absolutely right. And and the other thing from an investment standpoint um, uh, that, that I found is that like not every mechanism or not every strategy, I should say, uh, is created equally. Uh, so we were doing these flips and we were taking on a lot of risk and our average profit uh, was between twenty to $30,000 in our marketplace, uh, mm -hmm. which is normal for St. Louis's price point, different markets, different uh, different profits. But um, so we were making 20 to 30 and we we're taking on a lot of risk because when you invest the ex the length of the exit strategy, um, has a lot to do with the amount of risk that you're taking on. So yeah. when you're doing a flip, uh, the repairs have to come in perfect. You have to buy it right. You have to sell it at the right, perfect time versus like a long-term buy and hold strategy where, okay, maybe our, my repairs went over by $10,000, but guess what? I have a structure where I'm going to end up selling it in 20 years from now. So it's okay if a little bit of a mistake was made and, and, and it wasn't done perfectly. And, right. Uh, so then we made another shift. We went from our um, our flip model to a, a lease. You, you didn't even strategy. say you didn't even mean to do that one on purpose. <laughs> it was just natural. I might be the the perfect get, uh, guest yes, for your name. You are. As we done. all are it's about funny. shifts here, but keep going. <laughs> Um, and we fell in love with this model because it was, it's more profit with substantially less risk. We have higher cash flow and we have less risk than what a normal landlord takes on. Um, so it's already less risky and more profitable than a traditional landlord and traditional landlording compared to flipping is an incredible amount less risky because there's a, there's a, just that extension of, of the exit strategy. Right. So, uh, so we found this model and we, and we've been able to really scale it up and grow and, and, um, uh, there's something to be said about having, uh, a, a strategy that has risk adjusted returns, but then there's also something to be said about when you find a marketplace that has, um, that has crazy demand. Uh, what I found, I, I don't know about you guys, but, uh, whenever, I'm in the the, mar the market has shifted on me, and then I'm a real estate guy, so I'll talk about so, so whenever the real estate market shifted on me. If I kept going with the strategy that worked yesterday, it started to feel like I was pulling teeth to make a profit and to make sure my profit margin was intact. Uh, like we started out doing the short sales. Well, if, if people are doing short sales today, that uh, the market doesn't exist because every, because most people have a tremendous amount of equity in their home. A short sale is like, hey, if the property's worth a hundred and I owe two hundred thousand dollars on it, well, I have to. The bank needs to agree to sell the property short of the loan amount. So, um, so what we found is 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 that like when when we hit like the scaling up and the doing a lot of deals, like 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 when we get in sync of where where the market's at and we get in sync with where the demands at, my goodness, like our lease purchase deals. 
uh, we'll put it up and we'll start marketing them. We have a, a company called Homeways uh, that specializes in doing this for um, uh, for not only our own properties but for other landlords. And you know, we get over seventy inquiries on every single property, and we're able to whittle that down to five, and then and then place a person, and and it just becomes so much easier to run a business where the market is pulling you and the market demand is pulling you and, and, and you, and you're able to provide value in a unique way that, uh, uh, that the, that, that the market is, um, desiring. And, you know, I mean, it, like right now we're in the niche that we're in, like, I mean, we've done 340 of these deals in in the last, uh, a few months and, and the demand's been crazy for it. And, and we're actually, um, uh, earmarking, uh, uh, you know, taking uh, homeways and kind of growing it on on a national level now, and and it's it's because the market demand is 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 pulling us, and we're trying to keep up with it rather than us trying to create a market demand or 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 um or be in a market that 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 didn't or. That's yeah, and and you've business. you've picked an industry that's tough to be a CEO of because uh, having lots of experience of what you do, um, mm. you know, you literally have a new company every season, and and like at the time when I started my real estate company, it was it was called Seasons Realty Group, and everybody thought it was because about my name being named Winter, which. I was even smarter than that. It wasn't because of my name. It was because it could go for the seller season. It could go for the short sale season. It could go for the foreclosure season. It could go for the buyer season. And, um, and, and it's, so you're, you're, you're like a CEO of like many companies because your companies are changing all the time, right. And, and changing every year. So, um, how do you make sure that your company stays relevant in such a rapidly changing market? Uh, that's a fantastic question. So how do I make sure that they, they stay connected? Um, I mean, I think like just by knowing your numbers is, is like really the first well, stay step. Stay relevant. How do you stay relevant? Oh, how do I stay relevant? Um, how do I stay relevant? Um, you know, no one's ever asked me that before. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think, I mean, I, yeah, going back to the numbers, uh, um, I repeated the question wrong, but that is, I, I still would say it's the same principle because uh, if I know my numbers really well and I have my team locked in and now my my profitability is going down, um, uh, then I like to reassess like really everything, like like has the market shifted on us, has... Um, is there something going on with, with the people in the organization is, you know, is somebody going through something that we need to address? And, um, uh, like really the key is, is, is knowing the numbers and, and, and just staying abreast and, uh, to what's going on in the news with, within your industry too, you know, yeah. like interest rates change things a lot in real estate. They, a lot of people think interest rates, um, uh, have a negative impact on, on pricing of real estate. And uh, if you study it like I have, I've spent um, uh, hundreds of hours over the years studying real estate. Uh, there's not actually a correlation between interest rates going up and home prices going down, uh, which logically makes sense, right? Um, there's sometimes interest rates have gone up and home prices have gone up. There's sometimes that they've done the opposite or there's sometimes where one's gone up and the other's gone sideways. And uh, what I have, uh, what it, the interest rates do though is that they slow market and unit flow. So if a market's used to having a thousand sales a month, it might go down to 500 sales a month. Um, so there is a correlation there. And um, when that market shifts, uh, you do, like if you're just in that doing mode and you don't pause to like think about the, the new sandbox that you're in, um, it, it can really uh, lead to a difficult business. And so like when I first started in real estate, selling a property was the hustle. There's always a hustle in every market and what you're doing, man, you had to be so talented on the sales side because what made your house stand out from the 10 other ones that people were interested in buying nowadays, the sales, the easy part, but finding and acquiring the properties is really what takes talent and what, uh, where the hustle is. So 
uh, just being aware of it and having experience within it, then you know, okay, we need to shift more resources, more people come up with more creative things to find and acquire these deals. Um, but there's a, I mean, there's money to be had in every market. Um, uh, and there's also a hustle to be, uh, that needs to get figured out and a challenge in every market too, that, uh, problems that, that, that need to get solved. Yeah. Are there any good um, books that you would like books, resources, podcasts, things that you would recommend to a CEO who may be listening? Yeah. So uh, good to great was the first time I got exposed to like a, a Jim Collins calls it the hedgehog principle. Mm -hmm. And that is um, uh, the combination of what you're passionate about, what you can be world-class in and uh, what pays you. So you can be incredibly passionate about beer pong. You can be the world's best beer pong player, but if there's no money there, like there's not really a business there. Right. Yeah. So, um, so the secret to scaling up, uh, is, is finding that intersection and like knowing yourself, knowing what your organization is, knowing what you're good at, um, finding what the market, the market is where the demand is. Uh, and just because if you find a market where the demand is, but your team doesn't have that core competency, um, you, you'd be better off not doing that. You'd be better off finding something that is within your natural, uh, ability of your team. Right. Right. So, uh, that, uh, uh, Jim Collins, good to great. That's an oldie, but goodie. I, I'm sure there's a lot of listeners of, of heard of Jim and, and read it. And I might be showing my age. Cause I, I mean, I read that book over a decade so <laughs> it's yeah. been a while okay. it was one of my well, books favorite. are the best books um okay. all right and and besides relishing the uh expensive champagne if you could go back to a younger self a less experienced self um what would your advice be to yourself i uh, my advice would be the um uh to stay more focused don't branch out too soon and, you know, make sure that you, like, I used to think like I used to get, oh my gosh. Okay. This is maybe too much information, but for idea guys like me and idea guys, like a lot of y'all listening, what we don't realize is that ideas can be a high when you come up with a new idea, dopamine gets released and then it gets exciting. Oh my gosh, we have this new start and, and we can try this new thing out. Oh, it's so exciting. It's going to go so well. And then like a month into it or a couple of weeks into it, depend or for some of us, a couple hours into it, it's like, oh, this is work. Oh, we have to execute this. And it's not just about the, like, like the idea is one component of it and it's very important. I don't want to undersell that, but just as important is staying focused and executing on the idea uh, because like, you're not going to make money trying to do 10 ideas at once like yeah. Amazon. And it gets so confusing, right? Cause we see Amazon and we see all the different things that they do or Apple does. And Amazon sold books for like three years. Mm. And then after the third year, they went crazy. They really branched out. They started selling CDs online. Right. And only then once they had those, those really dialed in and mastered, did they start expanding into the company that they are today. And as entrepreneurs, and I, I want to we clarify, we're quick. talking about CDs, compact discs, CDs. not CD certificates out. of deposit. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Music CDs. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, some yeah. Of us we're listening. talking about compact discs, yeah. not certificates of deposit. <laughs> <laughs> which probably oh M gosh, sells so now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, um, I, I just think like you can have the big vision, like, come on, Jeff Bezos is just kind of smart. I'm pretty sure he saw Amazon with what it is now. He saw maybe not all of it, but he certainly saw a lot of it when he was just selling books, but he was yeah. disciplined enough to focus on selling books, to focus on getting it dialed in and developing that core competency, no matter how many years it took and then started branching out. And, and I mean, I tried, uh, it really slowed us down because I would try to, um, I, I tried to branch out a couple of times a little too quickly. I think, uh, then I, had and I think that's really good advice. I, I think, I think, um, I think there's people who need to hear that today because my stepdad being one of them, um, I know my mom listens to the podcast sometimes. So, but, um, 
Dave, if you're listening, that's that's really good advice because I do think there is a high when you come up with an idea. And I do think that a lot of CEOs are, in fact, visionaries and they they want to take every vision, but it's OK to pick one and and perfect it. So, um, OK, so if somebody listening wanted to take the next step with you, what would that be? Absolutely. Thanks for asking, Winter. Um, so if you can just remember my name, jimmanning.com. Uh, I have a lot of uh, wonderful free resources out there uh, on the website. Uh, I mean, we we make m- our money uh, through real estate investing. And so like, I don't have to charge like a couple grand for a course. Um, I, I, I spent some time on um, uh, creating a course called Passive Profits, a step-by-step guide to your first real estate fund investment. Um, I think ordinarily it'd be a couple thousand dollar course. Um, it's It's just free on the website, like sign it. Uh, learn it. And uh, ultimately our, our end goal is, is um, um, uh, we're looking for uh, people that want to ultimately invest into our fund and, and, and partner with us on deals. Uh, we don't always have deals available, but if I can provide your audience value, um, I would love to, and, and, you know, they can go take it and invest into something else if it, if it doesn't work out with us. But uh, yeah, we have the free course. I did a, a real estate market update as well. And so if you just go to jimmanning.com, uh, all of the different stuff will be on there and you can fill out your name and get access to that. And, and if you want to talk to our team about some of the uh, investment deals we have going to just, there's like a little checkbox to click to say, hey, let's let's talk. And um, yeah, we can, we can go from there. I, I appreciate you having me on, Winter. Perfect. Thank you so much. We, we appreciate you being here.